Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, hello, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to everyone for this lecture, which is part of the um, Development Studies and Bloomsbury DTC for the Social Sciences seminar series. My name is Faisi Ismail, uh, and I teach in Development Studies here at SOAS, and I'll be chairing the session. We have an extremely uh, special guest today, Professor David Harvey, who will be speaking on the... Mm. He'll be speaking on the subject of anti-value in Marx. David Harvey is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Geography at the Graduate Center of CUNY at the City University of New York. He's been um, writing on urbanization, the city, space, uneven geographical development, and capitalism for more than four decades. He's the author of many articles uh, and books, including The Limits of Capital, The Condition of Postmodernity, The New Imperialism, uh, Paris, Capital of Modernity, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, uh, Companion to Marxist Capital, uh, and most recently, uh, Rebel Cities from the Right to the City to the Urban Revolution in 2012, um, 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism in 2014, and in 2016, uh, The Ways of the World. He is credited with developing modern geography as a discipline, and he is one of the most uh, as you probably know, is one of the most cited academic geographers in the world, and his books have been translated into many different languages. Um, David Harvey studied at Cambridge and has taught at the University of Bristol, uh, Johns Hopkins University, the Uni University of Oxford, and has been at CUNY now for 15 years. And he was also a um, Miliband Fellow at the London School of Economics in the late 1990s. And he holds several honorary doctorates, including from the universities of Roskilde, Buenos Aires, Uppsala, Ohio State, Lund, and the University of Kent. Um, and in addition to all of that, he's been the recipient of numerous um, medals and prizes. He's produced, famously, um, online lectures on Marx's capital, which have received um, hundreds of thousands of views all over the world. Um, David Harvey's been a Marxist for most of his life and has been a staunch supporter of student activism um, and community and labor movements all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> So we are absolutely delighted um, that he can be with us this evening, and we're particularly happy um, that he joins us uh, not only in the centenary of, of SOAS, but also to celebrate 25 years of teaching development studies um, at SOAS. We've now run uh, the seminar series in this format, i.e. really large seminars, um, for more than a year now. Um, and the speakers we've hosted and, um, have been exemplary um, of the kind of work, the discussions uh, and debates um, that are taking place in uh, development studies currently. And, and, and we think our department at SOAS has a great deal to contribute to these discussions uh, and debates. And just to give you a flavor, of some of the um, seminars that we're going to be hosting next, uh, next term. I hope you all got a, a leaflet, and if you haven't got one, you can got, get one on the way out. Um, uh, we're going to be hosting Jayati Ghosh, Eric Reinert, and Rainer Cattell on uh, demolishing neoliberal development myths, um, Kavita Krishnan on uh, power and patriarchy in India, how state-led women's empowerment undermines women's movements, and we're all going, also going to have a, um, a panel on the Russian Revolution um, and global development lessons for the, from the first hundred years. Um, the seminar series would not be possible without your participation and your enthusiasm, but I also want to particularly thank our colleagues in um, the department in general, but also um, those who have helped put this series together. Joe Tomkinson, um, Nitya Natarajan, Jai Bhatia, Carolina Alves, um, and Alfredo Sadfilo. But also the many, many um, volunteer students that um, give their time and their energy to ensuring that the series runs um, smoothly. This is an organizational feat at times um, to put together, and we simply could not um, have pull it off uh, without our brilliant volunteers. Um, so, yes, please give a round of applause to them. <laughs> So the way we will run this session uh, is that David Harvey will speak for 45 to 50 minutes, um, and then we will hear from Alfredo Sadfilo, who will briefly discuss uh, David's presentation, and then we will open it up um, to questions from the floor, and we may take a few, uh, a few rounds. And just two final things. Um, 
yeah, as I say, if you haven't got a leaflet, uh, get one outside. And if you're on Twitter, um, the hashtags uh, are SOAS Dev Studies and ESRC. Thank you. Well, it's uh, great to be here. And talking um, about supporting labor struggles, I've just been talking to some representatives of the cleaners here at SOAS who've fought a fantastic job. And uh, they are struggling, as are all elements in the uh, labor movement, to deal with problems of subcontracting, of uh, the ways in which uh, management does everything it can to avoid uh, its obligations and to exploit its labor forces by all sorts of means. So uh, I gather they have made some uh, very important advances here and so as. I think that's terribly important. but. They are as much members of the university as you are, and I think that uh, on that basis, it seems to me important that they no longer be subject to subcontracting, and that they should be brought in as part of the staff of the university so that we can have a, a real community of people from all walks of life as part and parcel of what the university is about instead of it being increasingly fragmented. Uh, very soon, by the way, a lot of teaching is beginning to be subcontracted. So uh, the faster you re resist this kind of uh, process, it seems to me, uh, the, more, uh, the more it would uh, benefit uh, everyone uh, to be participants and in particular give them as much support as you can. Now, um, one of the things I've been doing over the last, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years is, uh, I, I, I guess in retrospect, I call it the Marx Project. Um, and I say in retrospect because I had no idea I was getting into it when I started it, but it seems to have taken me over. Uh, I w would like to get out of it, but it seems that <laughs> more and more I seem to get into it. And the project was founded on the fact that I was getting more and more impatient with uh, a lot of misrepresentations of Marx. And I felt that uh, something had to be done about that. Uh, I was also getting imp impatient with uh, some of the work being done by Marxists, which seemed to be dedicated to making Marx even more complicated than he already is. And that, uh, therefore, uh, there was a, a, a niche to be filled, which was to try to find ways of representing what it was that Marx had to say uh, that were simple enough without being simplistic, uh, which were relevant to understanding uh, everyday life, uh, and uh, to try to uh, find ways to bring people in to see that uh, this particular critical way of understanding what is going on is not only re revealing, but also is helpful in diagnosing what to do about uh, uh, the dilemmas which are emerging all around us. Uh, in the course of this, this led to a lot of uh, publications, but it also led uh, to uh, uh, some exploration of various uh, techniques uh, and uh, uh, about uh, six months or so ago, I, I was thinking of uh, trying to come up with a visualization of what uh, capital was about. And I went back, you know, being a geographer, I was uh, very well aware of uh, what always seemed to me a rather wonderful visualization of the hydrological cycle or the water cycle. And the thing I liked about it is you can get this sort of map of, you know, the water's in the oceans, it's in a sort of pretty solid state, it then evaporates, goes into a gaseous state, goes up, circulates round, then it comes down as precipitation, different forms of precipitation, then gets on the land and gets back into the ocean, but has different ways of traveling across the land. Uh, some of it gets stored in underground aquifers until humans come along and pump the water out. Some of it gets stored in ice caps and things like that. So this system keeps on going round and round and uh, is, a, is an example of uh, uh, what Hegel kind of called a virtuous uh, infinity, that it uh, has the possibility to go on forever and ever. Though it does turn out that uh, its main source of energy, i.e. the energy from the sun, while it is constant from the outside, 
is arriving at planet Earth differentially, so there are some changes going on in the hydrological cycle because the energy levels which are felt uh, through the cycle are gradually changing with climate change and all the rest of it. But it seemed to me that uh, when I was thinking about that, I went back to Marx's definition of capital. And the definition of capital, which I think is uh, central to what he does, is that capital is value in motion. And therefore, it seemed to me important to say, well, where does capital move from to? What's its motion about? How can it be put together? And could I do something like uh, the uh, uh, hydrological cycle for the cycle of, of, of what is capital? And uh, what you see up there is what I've uh, come up with. And it's a very simple diagram, and like all simple diagrams, it uh, misrepresents in some regards, and, and, and uh, I'll talk about some of those as, as we go forward. But basically, the circulation of capital goes like this. That if you start with money down at the bottom here, bottom here, and not all money is capital, uh, but capital is money used in a certain way, uh, which becomes uh, money capital. And the money capital is used to purchase commodities, mainly labor, power, and means of production. And it's put into the process of production with a given technology. Now, the interesting thing about this first part is that in order for capital even to begin to circulate, there has to be a very sophisticated monetary system already in existence. It pre-exists. There already has to be a labor market, and there already has to be a commodity market where you can go and buy means of production. So all of those elements had to precede, as it were, the, 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 the emergence of this form of circulation, which is the form of capital circulation. Now, once it gets into production, uh, then there are two things that happened, and there's a duality about production. Uh, there is the production of commodities, i.e. the material things which are going to be sold in the market, but there's also the production of value and surplus value. So there's a double operation there, and there's, I think this is terribly important always to remember uh, that when Marx talks about production, he doesn't necessarily mean com production of commodities, he often means production of value and surplus value, and we have to be very, very careful about maintaining that uh, distinction. Uh, but the production process then is, is value creating and surplus value creating, but it does it through the physicality of the production of commodities. Then those commodities are taken into the market and they are sold. Uh, but there are different kinds of commodities. There are wage goods, which are then picked up and taken back uh, into the reproduction of labor power as part of the value and define what the value of labor power is about. Uh, there are luxuries, uh, uh, as well as uh, daily production goods, some of which flow uh, to the bourgeoisie in terms of their own production, uh, their own uh, uh, con consumption. And there's also the production, of course, of means of production, which flow back directly back in, circle back into the production process. So th the production that goes on in terms of commodities has that threefold character. But across all three of those elements, the, the, the simple idea comes that the, the value is realized, and it's realized in a different form. That is, uh, what was uh, a commodity, which then became production uh, of a commodity, now becomes money. So you go from beginning with money to money and the realization of value in money form, uh, and uh, this is a, a, a big shift because as soon as you move into the, the money form, different things start to happen which can't happen in the commodity form. And I think that it's very important to recognize the significance of this moment of realization of value because it's a transition in form, a bit like uh, what happened in the hydrological cycle when something moved from, say, a gaseous state into, into crystals and, uh, and the like. So it's a transformation of form, uh, with a metamorphosis, as Marx liked to call it, and a metamorphosis which has important implications. So the moment of realization is significant, uh, but uh, to be realized, it means that people have to have enough money to be able to buy it, and they have to want to buy. So the question of wants, needs, and desires feeds into this, and also wants, needs, and desires backed by ability to pay. 
and the ability to pay uh, has a, a very important role to play in the moment of realization. Now, once the, the, the capital has been realized in monetary form, it gets distributed. And I, I'm, I'm turning this into a sequence. This is really always going on simultaneously, but it's useful to sort of set it out this way just for visualization purposes. But once uh, the capital is in its money form, it gets distributed. Some of it gets distributed in the form of wages. Some of it gets take, taken as taxes. Uh, some of it gets taken as profit of industrial capital and then rent and interest and, and, and so on. So it's distributed uh, in various forms. And therefore, we get the moment of distribution. Uh, and the moment of distribution is, again, rather separate. Uh, why is it that the wage rate is at the level that it's at? Why is it that rents are where they are? Why is it that the rate of interest is what it is? There are all kinds of questions that arise around questions of distribution, which is significant. But all of that money which it gets distributed in this way then has two paths uh, to take. Uh, one is that the path is that uh, the money forms part of the effective demand, so it flows back. Uh, into the moment of realization as uh, uh, wage, uh, the wages of the workers flow back to buy the commodities which reproduce labor power. Uh, then you get bourgeois consumption, but you also get state expenditures, which are terribly important and which Marx does not spend very much time talking about. And I'll again come back to that uh, in, a little, in, a, in a little bit. So it either goes that way or else it goes the other way, that is, it goes back into production, which is going back into the cycle uh, that we're talking about. Uh, and as it goes back as reinvestment, it generates another form of demand, which is, which is the demand uh, of productive consumption. So there are two sources of demand. One is the final consumption, which is at the top there, and the other is productive consumption, which is at the bottom. And these two forms of demand are, uh, uh, if you like, the account for the totality of demand in a, in a given society. So this is the way in which the whole kind of cycle, cycle works. And when you look at it, uh, you see that uh, there are these metamorphoses, that is, uh, things that are in a money form go into a commodity form, and then they go back to the money form, or they go into productive activity. And it is a continuous circular process. And in the same way that you can ask the question, uh, where is the main energy coming from to push this system along as happened in the case of the hydrological cycle? It was energy coming in from the sun. Where is the primary source of energy uh, that is going to impel this system onwards and what is that source of energy doing? Now, the classic way to look at that is the way that Marx does, uh, of course, in, in volume one of Capital in particular, to say that nobody in their right mind would start the day with a certain amount of money as at the bottom and end up with the same amount of money at the end of the day after you've gone through realization. So they would only, their only incentive for engaging in that form of activity would indeed to get an increment, which is, of course, uh, the profit or the surplus value. So that therefore surplus value becomes critical uh, and the procurement of surplus value becomes the critical, and it's the incentive, if you like, that individual capitalists have when they enter into production to cultivate as much uh, surplus value as they possibly can through the exploitation of living labor in production and that this is the, the fundamental form of energy. But uh, actually, it turns out when you start to look at this, and this is the advantage, I think, of, of uh, setting up something this way of a visualization of this sort, uh, it also turns out you have to ask the question of what happens if at the end of the day there's no profit to be had anyway? Uh, where would the energy come from if, for some reason or other, there's not enough wants, needs, and desires, effective demand, or pr demand for productive consumption? Uh, what, what, what would happen to this circulation process? Because it becomes very clear from Marx the continuity in this circulation process is foundational and fundamental. And that if, therefore, this system gets jammed up or stopped at any point, 
Uh, then you have a major macro crisis on your hands. And that's because one of the things that I want to talk about also is that where do crises come from? And the answer is they can come from almost any point upon this map because whenever there is some moment where the system cannot continue, cannot pass through a barrier, cannot overcome certain limits or constraints, then you will have a crisis. And a crisis can break out almost anywhere. Well, one of the ways in which you can get a crisis is that uh, when uh, capitalists take their, uh, their, their commodity to market, they don't find anybody who wants, needs, or desires it, or they don't find enough people with enough effective demand to actually pay for it. So at that point, there would be a complete blockage in the circulation of capital, there would be massive devaluation, and, and, that, would, and, and that would be a kind of a, a major uh, difficulty that would then have to be resorted to. When something like that comes close to happening, what, what happens? Well, the answer is state expenditures typically come in to try and figure the gap. So you have, as it were, a manipulation of demand way in which there can be some incentive uh, to continue the dynamics of this system. And that, of course, was the Keynesian solution uh, in a very broad kind of sense that you, you face with uh, low profit rates and, and nowhere to go, then what do you do? You jack up demand through state expenditures. Uh, and uh, then the question arises, where do, the, where do the state expenditures come from? Do they come out of existing taxes or do you manufacture them by actually manufacturing money? There we get into something else, which is a kind of a certain things that go on in the field of distribution, which uh, again, I'm going to come back to in, in, in a minute. So that, but that's the second source of incentive. That is uh, the, the effect of demand management, uh, which increasingly in a capitalist society became significant and, and, and important. Uh, the third source lies in the, the moment of distribution. Uh, and this source is interesting. And I put in there the kind of question of the circulation of interest-bearing capital. Because people with surplus money and surplus funds uh, sitting there need to have activity which is going to give enough money uh, to them uh, to, to survive. And so they set in motion interest-bearing capital. And in this I include, of course, uh, you know, uh, purchases of stocks and bonds and all the rest of it. So this is put into circulation. And there's an interesting kind of question right now as to who is the primary source of the incentive to keep this system going and the pace it's going. Uh, is it, is it uh, individual capitalists seeking surplus value and, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the greed or the interest of the, of the entrepreneur? Is that what's driving it? Is it state expenditures that are driving it? Or is it the needs of the bondholders to have somewhere to put their money where they're going to get a rate of return? which is the most important driver. And one of the things I want to suggest here is that actually this third source of incentive and energy is becoming, and has actually taken over very strongly as the primary source of the, the compulsion of this system to uh, continue uh, and the like. So there are those three sources of incentive to increase. And if you look at them, you would say, well, actually, in any given situation, probably it's a mixture of all three. But what, which is the balance between them, which one is, you know, is most important and most significant becomes, I think, a, a very important issue to discuss uh, and to debate. The uh, second thing is that unlike the, uh, uh, the hydrological cycle, this is not what uh, Hegel called a virtuous infinity. This is uh, a bad infinity, what he called a bad infinity. And a bad infinity is something that has no end. It has to grow. Because this system is based, in fact, on growth. So instead of it being a cycle, it becomes a spiral. And if you go to the Grundrisse, uh, Marx talks very, in a number of places about the transformation from simple reproduction, which is circular, to spiral form. And if you notice the structure of both volume two and um, volume one of Capital, there are chapters on simple reproduction, which is talking about capital in its uh, kind of uh, uh, virtuous infinity state. And then kind of says, well, okay, what happens to the virtuous infinity when it becomes a bad infinity and you start talking about accumulation for accumulation's sake, uh, endless capital accumulation you know, sort of thing. 
So that uh, this is a, a sort of a, one, one of the things about uh, this system that it is not an example of uh, virtuous infinity. It's uh, an example of, a, of a, uh, a bad infinity. And as we know, we have a nice expression in English about using the word spiral. We say things spiral out of control. And there's a very interesting kind of question as to the degree to which capital is now spiraling out of control. And should we actually take the spiral form when we start to look at this and start to ask some very serious questions about it? There is now another point that I want to make, and I think this is absolutely crucial for the way in which we read capital. The three volumes of capital address completely different segments of this whole process. Volume one of capital starts with the money and takes you up to the point of realization. Okay. So it's just that side. When it gets to the point of realization, what does, it, what does it say? In volume one of Capital, Marx says, I assume everything exchanges at its value. That is, there is no problem of realization. And furthermore, he says, I assume the manner in which the surplus is distributed has no impact. So he abstracts entirely from the moment of realization and from the moment of distribution. And he says, those elements are irrelevant. I'm therefore going to model a capitalist system as if realization and distribution is entirely neutral and has no impact, has no role to play in this whole kind of circulation process. And on that basis, of course, he derives, it's a model which is, which is just that segment up to realization. It's a model uh, of capital and on that basis, he derives things like the general law of capital accumulation and, and, and the like. But I want to make it very clear that this is a restricted model and it's only as good as its assumptions. And if you assume there's no problem of realization, i.e. no problem in the market, and you assume there is no role to be played by facts of distribution, uh, then of course you can come to certain kinds of conclusions. But they're contingent conclusions on the assumptions. Now most people, of course, read volume one when they read Marx and they read it very carefully, but they get the idea sometimes that that's the whole of the story about capital. But when you look at what volume does in relationship to this whole system, you see it is not the whole story of capital at all. In fact, what Marx says in the Grundrisse is that capital, in order to understand it, you have to look at the contradictory unity between production and realization of value. That is, you cannot assume realization is constant. You cannot assume it's, it's neutral in this whole thing. In fact, it's very important. So what does volume two do? Volume two actually is really looking in part at the whole thing through the circuits of capital, the circuit of money capital and commodity capital and productive capital and industrial capital. So there's a kind of a discussion of what the whole thing looks like. But basically, volume two is really about some of the questions of realization. But Marx approaches the questions of realization in a very curious way. He assumes there is no problem of realization. Now, that's sort of a bit Marxist, of course, to uh, uh, look at the problems of realization by, assume, by assuming there are none. But his tactic is actually to work back from an equilibrium position to say, well, let's suppose there's no no problems of realization and, and, and actually all commodities exchange at their value, then we can start to talk about the conditions under which that equilibrium point can, be, can, can occur. And when you start to look at the conditions, you find the conditionalities which are placed on what capital has to do are so finely adjusted and all the rest of it that all sorts of things can potentially go wrong which means that you won't ever get to the equilibrium position, even though you've assumed that's where you want to be. And one of the big things that goes on there is Marx starts to talk about the turnover time. And that becomes very significant in the whole of this thing, because we also have to ask the question, how fast are we moving around? How quickly do we move around? And again, one of the things that comes up is that Marx in volume two also assumes that technological change is zero. This is again a very strange assumption. So with all commodities sold uh, at their value in volume two and no technological change, he then builds some models of how the economy actually works and what the problems are. 
of actually demand not meeting supply and all the rest of it. So it's an exploration of the dynamics of realization under, again, some very, very interesting assumptions. And one of the things I want to emphasize in reading Capital is always be aware, always be aware of the assumptions that Marx is using in any particular part of the text. Because on the basis of those assumptions, he will say this and this happens. But they are contingent on the assumptions. Drop the assumptions and that doesn't happen. But people take those snippets and say, oh, he said this or he said that, you know, and treat it as if they're, you know, law statements that should apply under all circumstances. No, they're usually laws derived under a certain set of assumptions and change the assumptions and those laws no longer work the way that he describes. So volume two is a very curious kind of thing, but it basically focuses on the question of realization. And in particular, I think, for me, it does something very, very significant, which is that in looking at differential turnover times, Marx starts to recognize, and particularly when he starts to look at fixed capital circulation and the like, starts to recognize that this system that he's looking at cannot work without there being a well-organized and very sophisticated credit system. In other words, if you want to smooth out the monetary exchanges that come uh, from an exchange practices where some people are realizing their product at once a year and some people every three months and some people every, every two days, if you're going to smooth all that out and if you're going to have differential sort of turnover times of fixed capital lasting 10 years, 20 years, and the like, you need a sophisticated credit system because if you did not have a credit system, the only way in which capital could fund all of this was, is to hoard money, to hoard capital. In other words, this hoarding would be huge and in order to release the hoard, the credit system has to come in and smooth everything out. So there's an absolute necessity for the credit system to do that. Which brings us to then to the, what's going on in, in volume three. Volume three is basically about distribution. It's about the distribution of uh, the surplus value between individual capitalists in such a way that, uh, as we know from equalization of the rate of profit, that uh, it's from each uh, capital according to the surplus value they produce and to each capital according to the capital they advance. So there's a kind of uh, strange distributive, redistributive act set of activities that go on amongst individual capitalists. But then the distributions between rent and interest, taxes and all the rest of it becomes, again, rather, rather uh, an element to be, to be looked at. And of course, Given what I've just said about the importance of the credit system, Marx is in a situation where he's going to have to look at each one of these distributive categories and ask, why is it that this category is insignificant and important for a fully developed capitalist system? In other words, he's not interested in examining feudal residuals. I mean, he has chapters on those things, but he's really interested in why is it that the extraction of rent exists in a society which is dominated by industrial capital? Why is it that the interest rate is so significant to the industrial capitalists? Why is it that those, all those elements are tolerated uh, even though they look like they came from you know, feudal residuals? Why is it that there is a capitalist form of land rent, a capitalist form of interest, a, a capitalist form of uh, state and taxation and all the rest of it? That's the question he's really, uh, he's really asking. Now, what this says then is that the three volumes of capital are situated in relationship to this diagram. One is on the left-hand side doing that. One's on the top about realization. Another is about distribution. And Marx had the idea, which is developed very much in the Grundrisse, that he really wanted to look at capital as a totality. And one of the arguments I want to make is that if we were projecting forward as to where Marx was going to go with these incomplete volumes of volume two and volume three and all the, where would he have gone after he had completed them. Surely it would have been towards trying to reconstruct capital as value in motion, as a totality of all of these different moments. In other words, really to understand what capital is about, we need to keep all of these elements in play with each other. And we need to be thinking about the circulation process of capital as a whole and its spiral form and what is happening to it. In other words, in other words instead, of, 
you know, just studying and taking a few lines out of volume two and saying, see, that's what he says, or see what he says in volume three, or see what he says somewhere else. We should really start to rewrite what he's saying around the idea of the totality of this system, which is going on and on and on, but it's also spiraling onwards and potentially, as I've suggested right now, spiraling out of control. If so, where is the spiraling happening and why is it happening in the way that it's particularly happening? Now, in the middle of looking at all of this, I think that something interesting immediately comes out, which is this. That at the very first chapter, in the very first section of Volume 1 of Capital, Marx is talking about the value theory. So it's value in motion. And he's talking about you know, the labor theory of value, and I don't have time to elaborate about how Marx is, is developing that labor theory of value here. But he's talking about that, and I'm talking about its motion. But he says something very interesting, because the first section is all about the production of value and socially necessary labor time, abstract labor, all those kinds of things become significant. But the last two sentences of the section say this. He says, if there is not a want, need, or desire for a commodity, and if there is no effective demand for a commodity, then there is no value. The labor expended on the good is wasted. It's irrelevant. Now, this is interesting, because right throughout the rest of Capital, as I've said, he's going to rule out the rest of volume one of capital, he's going to rule out any problems of this sort, but what this means is that in order for, for value to be produced, there has to be a society in which wants, needs, and desires are orchestrated in such a way as to consume the kinds of products that are being created. And therefore, one of the big things about the whole history of capitalism is the creation of new wants, needs, and desires. And value is contingent on that. Most people concentrate when they're reading about Marx on production. He's on about that all the time in volume one. That's his topic in volume one. But that's not the whole story. Because if you're interested in the unity, contradictory unity between production and realization, if you get to this point of realization and there's no want, need, and desire, it has not been created. And if there is no effective demands because nobody has enough money to buy it, then there is no value. So value does not exist outside of a state, a given state of wants, needs, and desires. So where does that state of wants, needs, and desire come from? Well, I put something up there about you know, production and reproduction of human nature. And I think this, again, is terribly important because actually you have, to you have to produce new kinds of human beings with new wants and needs and desires to keep going with a lot of what capital is, production is about. And in particular, when you start to look at things like turnover time, you've got to start to look at accelerating turnover time. Well, you can't accelerate turnover time in production without actually accelerating turnover time in consumption. How many times have you bought a new phone in the last 10 years? Capital creates things in such a way as to structure things, but then we consume it. And we have to consume it. If we always decided to turn our phones off and throw them away, you know, you know, capital would be in a terrible, terrible mess. And so the construction of wants, needs, and desires in society becomes a terribly important part of value theory, or should be a part of value theory. It can't, it cannot, you cannot avoid it. But Marx avoids it entirely in volume one of capital, and interestingly in volume two of capital, by assuming that all commodities always exchange at their values. But he said, you know, I, I, I know that's not necessarily true. And his assumption, it's not necessarily true. Now, what this says is that actually capital can produce not value. Not value. And this, suddenly, when you go back and you read Marx, you find that actually this notion of not value is coming in all over the place. Because he says... A commodity loses its value, not because it can't be sold, but because it cannot be sold within a certain time. So the temporality of the system becomes significant. Speed up the temporality and something has to be sold 
you know, very quickly, very fast. Consumer times have to be reduced. And if capital cannot restructure society around the idea of fast turnover times in consumption, then it is screwed. I mean, I still, you know, use my grandmother's knives and forks. If capital only made things like knives and forks like that, you know, good solid Sheffield steel that just cannot possibly be broken or smashed around or fall apart when you pick it up. You know, the, if capital produced things like that, it would be, it would be a disaster. <laughs> okay. And of course, people are always yelling at me saying, they're old fashioned knives and forks. Why don't you get some of those slick new ones? You know, I mean, I, so the fashion industry, all the rest of it gets in here too. So, so my, my, my point about this is that the value theory has to incorporate this. Most discussions of Marx's value theory concentrate solely on production. They do not concentrate on the state of what wants, needs, and desires when it is absolutely the case, the end of section one of volume one of Capital, he says if there's no wants, needs, and desires, there's no value. So no value becomes significant. And actually, he models no value throughout the Grundrisse in particular, but in a very, very interesting way. He basically says, whenever the motion stops, value is gone. That is, if, if a commodity stays as a commodity for more than a certain period of time, it's going to be devalued. If capital spends too much time in production, it's devalued. If it spends too much time on the market, it's devalued. So each one of these, and, you know, and I assemble a whole bunch of uh, little pieces of his you know, together and put a composite together and you get this, this, this picture that actually capital is circulating here where it is value and then it actually is not value anymore. It's anti-value and then suddenly it gets resuscitated again because it gets pushed back in motion. So he's actually getting a situation in which there's a dialectic going on all of the time between value and anti-value. And this dialectic between value and anti-values is absolutely critical to his, the way in which he understands where crises potentially come from. Because they come from the anti-value, which is always, always there. It doesn't come from outside, it doesn't come, it's always, always there. And it's always the possibility. And everybody will know surely what that means. A capitalist who goes into production and, and ends up producing something and takes it to market and nobody wants, needs, and desires it, it just sits there, but they, they've lost their value. That's anti-value. They, they confront the potentiality of anti-value every day, every, every, all, all the time. So you have to then say, well, actually, Marx's theory of value is really a theory of value and anti-value in dialectical relation. And then people look at you as so you're crazy, and I can say, well, but how does contemporary physics understand the world? It understands it as a relation between matter and antimatter. Everything is set up that way. And Marx is thinking about capital that way. And I like to talk to these economists who have physics envy by saying, actually, Marx got to this way of thinking before the physicists did. If they'd read Marx and then started doing their physics the way Marx you know, sets this up, they would have had matter and antimatter in their heads way at the very, very beginning, you know? Because <laughs> Marx had value and anti-value in his head all the way through this, all the way through this. Now, the, the anti-value is a complicated question, and I don't have time to go into all of its details here. I mean, I'm trying to work some of these out, but let me give you the, the, the big idea of anti-value. What is the biggest form of anti-value you can think of? It's debt. Debt is a claim on future labor. It's a fictitious claim on future labor. And debt has to be redeemed by value production. That's why interest-bearing capital and lending of capital becomes absolutely crucial to the dynamics of this capitalist society we're in. All of the data you look, at since the 1970s shows a huge, huge increase in indebtedness, in private and public indebtedness. The, the, the total indebtedness in the economy, you know, the IMF has just put out a report on total indebtedness in the global economy. And it's 225% of the total GDP of the world. 
Okay? That's what it is right now. Now, in 2000, it was only 200%. Back in 1970, it was about, you know, 70%, you know. So you just look at this, and what you see is greater and greater, greater amounts of indebtedness, which is anti-value being created. And interestingly, when you start to look at this, and this is where my geography starts to come in, you start to look at this in all these kinds of ways, production, realization, distribution don't necessarily occur in the same place. So actually, what, we, what we've got, I mean, here in London, we have all of these debt bottling plants, which are actually anti-value creation plants, which are spreading their net around the world in such a way, and then saying somebody somewhere has to create the value to redeem all of this debtedness. And who's going to create that value that's going to redeem it? Not them in London. No, good God, they're going to sit there, drink their you know, martinis at lunchtime kind of thing. No, who's going to do it is the people in Bangladesh and the people in Shenzhen and all the rest of it. And you'll see exactly the same thing going on in other moments of this whole circulation process. Because value is produced in one place doesn't mean it is realized in that place. The value produced by Foxconn in my Apple computer is produced in Shenzhen. It's realized in the United States by Apple. The rate of return on capital for Foxconn, last I read the Financial Times, was something like 3%. The rate of return on Apple is 28%, which says that value being created in China is being realized in the United States. In the same way that debt being created in New York and, and London is being redeemed in Bangladesh and Shenzhen and all the rest of it. So these are the, these are the kinds of things that come out of this this, this way of, 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 of thinking, and the significance of anti-value is, is, is this, that actually it's all about foreclosing on the future. That is, you cannot get out of capital. I mean, the reason it's so hard to imagine getting out of capital is because we're so indebted that we're actually foreclosed upon in terms of what we're going to do for about the next 15 to 20 years. Which is, of course, exactly why in the United States, we've created a whole generation of debt-encumbered students because debt-encumbered students are obligated to go out for the rest of their lives and retire the damn debt. So it, since debt is a, is a claim on future labor, future labor has already been mortgaged and has already been structured in such a way that there's almost no way we can get out of it, and that is how capital is reproducing itself now, is by putting these debt claims. And of course, behind it lies the tendency to get into the thing where so much debt is being created, if it's 225% of all the global GDP, and, it, and rising, rising continuously, and actually it's been rising significantly since 2007, 2008. I mean, you would have thought after 2007, 2008, you would have seen, be seeing a deleveraging of society, but it's not. It's being leveraged higher and higher and higher. And so these are, the, these are the kinds of things that actually, when you're sort of looking at this, you kind of say, where's the energy to reproduce a capitalist system anymore? I really don't believe the individual entrepreneur who's just greedy for, for profit is kind of as anywhere near as significant now as it was in the 19th century. I think it's more and more, and I think the Keynesian stuff is still there, very much there. It's just that it's not being filtered through social welfare things. It's mainly subsidies to capital through military expenditures and all the rest of it. So there's still a great deal of Keynesianism around and state ut utilization. And the state, of course, is borrowing, and it's a form of interest-bearing capital that goes through the state and, and again, is foreclosing uh, on the future of what a state can do. And you can see right now, who's in power in the world? It's the bondholders, right? And if the bondholders are in power, they have to be somewhere within this system and located within this system in such a way as to exercise control over the totality of it. And I think it is important to think totality. Marx didn't finish this. And I think we should be working on how to finish this. And there are lots of kind of complications in this, in this system. But to me, it's useful to have a visualization of this kind because it tells you all kinds of aspects of how this world is working. The speed up, the necessity to produce instantaneous forms of consumption,
Why is it that in our society, actually the society is one of spectacle? Why is it that the geography of this thing is redistributing incredibly from sites of production of values to sites of distribution to, to sites of realization, how all of that redistribution is going on secretly, as it were, in terms of the dynamic. And I think that Marx's analysis, which I'm trying to push, push through here, which is, which is to set up something like this, and to do it in, 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 in this simplified way, actually poses some wonderful, interesting kinds of questions as to how this system is going to survive when it is spiraling, as I've suggested, because the one form of capital which can increase infinitely without any restraint whatsoever is the money form, provided the money form is liberated from any material constraint, which of course has happened in the demonetization uh, of the world money system. I mean, you can just add a few zeros to the money supply anytime you like. It can go on infinitely. It's difficult to have an infinite increase in commodities. It's difficult to have an infinite increase in productive activity. All the other forms can't stretch to the bad infinity. But the one bad infinity that is possible is in fact the money supply. And guess who's launching the money supply, who's using it, who's leveraging it, who's, you know, where it's coming from. So this system depends more and more on what's going on in the center of distribution. Now Marx, quite understandably, in volume one, emphasized the moment of production and did an extremely good job, I think, of talking about what goes on on that left-hand side. And, 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 it's, and it's great. But we're not going to get anywhere unless we actually read volume two that nobody ever really bothers to read <laughs> and, and, and really get into the distributive side of volume three and what the distributive side is really all about. And then, of course, we have to do some other things, which is, you know, to me as a geographer is very important. Is, okay, how is this form of motion actually occurring in space and time? And actually, what are the spatio-temporalities of all of this? Why is it that capital surpluses that are the, 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 bad, the, the bad infinity gets absorbed, as it were, but now increasingly is being absorbed in such a way as to be almost totally destructive? And I just cannot ever resist talking about some of the things that are going on in the world. Very, you know, in my interest in urbanization and urban development, you have to understand that on the commodity side, some incredible things are happening. That the Chinese consumed more cement in two or three years, 2011 to 2012, than the United States consumed in the whole century. That is, 45% more cement they consumed in two, three years than the United States consumed in the preceding 100 years. And if you've lived in the United States, we know, you know, we've poured a lot of cement. But, the, but when you go to China, I mean, it is astonishing what they've done. It's astonishing. In 2007, the Chinese had zero miles of high-speed train network. They now have 12,000, and they're going to go to 19,000 within the next three years. I mean, this is an astonishing transformation. The result is that China has consumed half of the world's cement, half of the world's steel, about 60 or 70 percent of the world's copper. And everybody who has produced those goods has done very well out of the China trade until the China trade starts to go down a bit because, as always happens in these situations, somebody starts to see that actually there's overproduction of the built environment. 25% of Chinese GDP has been taken up by housing construction alone. 50% of GDP in, the, in China has been taken up by urbanization and infrastructural development alone. I mean, this is an astonishing transformation of the world, but if you compare it to what happened in the US after World War II, the interstate highway system, the building of the suburbs, which was a similar kind of way of absorbing surplus capital in a huge urbanization project, the Chinese is far, far bigger than, than that whole thing that happened then. 
And if you compare it back, as I like to do always with, you know, what happened in Hausmann's Paris, I mean, Hausmann's Paris was a sort of little, little blip like this compared to what happened uh, in the United States after 1945 and what's happening in China since 2007, 2008. Now, the interesting thing is, my view is that global capitalism was stabilized after 2007 and 2008 by one country, China, and by one doing one thing, pouring cement. And that was a solution to the crisis. And now they've poured enough cement and don't know what to do with it. So what are they doing? They're actually taking their cement and, and building rail lines and, and, and steel and, and, and building rail lines all over East Africa. Uh, they have the one road, one uh, th thing where they're going to go from, you know, Shanghai to Istanbul, right through Central. They're building transcontinental uh, rail and road links across uh, the Andes into in, across the Amazonia. The, I mean, the, the Chinese have got surplus productive capacity. And what does everybody do when they've got surplus productive activity? They engage in what I call the spatial fix. You find somewhere else to, to use your surplus productive capacity. So that's what they're doing. But again, all of this is, is funded by the fact that China is now one of the most indebted countries in the world. It started 2007 and 2008 with hardly any debt. It's now hugely indebted. It's one of the most, you know, it's, it's about, you know, something like 285 or even 300% of GDP debt. The only thing about China is it's not indebted in dollars, it's indebted in its own currency. And the advantage of that is it can just add zeros to its own currency, you know? So it's, not, you know. So, these are the kinds of things that it seems to me that, that come out when you start with a, with a, with a simple, uh, representation of this kind, which I think, I hope, I, I, I like to think is, is reasonably comprehensible, reasonably understandable. There's a, a way in which people can understand and understand that some of, some of the relations that exist within this dynamic, a simple dynamic of what happens uh, when you start to consider capital as value in motion. And then you start to map that capital, both in space and time, but also in terms of the ways in which these uh, elements uh, are pulled together into a coherent uh, system, which is actually then entering into what I would call this uh, dangerous uh, spiral uh, infinity, this uh, bad infinity, which is spiraling out of control. So my time's up, so let me leave it there. Thank you. David. Um, so we're now going to hear from uh, Alfredo Sadfilo. Alfredo is Professor of Political Economy in Development Studies, and he's written widely on neoliberalism, Latin American uh, political and economic development, um, and the labor theory of value, amongst much else. Um, just briefly. Um, thanks, Faisy, and, and thanks, David, for a fantastic presentation. This was, this was really great. Um, it's, of course, a, a huge uh, honor to be here uh, this evening. Uh, David Harvey is incredibly influential uh, as an analyst, as a, as a theorist within the broad field of Marxist political economy, um, has been hugely influential in my own uh, life as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a great privilege um, to be here. And it has been uh, one of the most elegant, one of the most clear and lucid presentations of uh, Marxist uh, theory of value that I have seen. And this diagram will be spotted in my own lectures um, next term. <laughs> um, and this is clearly a, a, a difficult topic. And David illustrated uh, some of the uh, complications uh, of the attempt to, to capture the determining features, the defining, the distinguishing features of capitalism in a, in, a, in, in a comprehensible amount of theoretical work. And in doing this, Marxist political economy and Marxist political economists have demonstrated the same amount of um, sectarianism, craziness, personal madness as any uh, group of theorists working anywhere in the social sciences and the, in, the, in the hard sciences as well. In the case of Marxist political economy, this is particularly uh, complex because uh, disputes will involve what Marx uh, said, what Marx uh, 
should have said, what Marx would have said if he had completed uh, his uh, work, uh, how uh, to what extent Marx's work applies uh, today, and how can we apply this in order to make the revolution as rapidly as possible. All of this leading to an enormous overlapping set of uh, difficulties that sometimes become extremely funny. Um, the um, relevance of it all to me is transparent. It is exactly what David said at the beginning. It is uh, to capture uh, everyday life. That, that is the point of, of the whole uh, figure. It is the point of the work of Marx. How can we understand the world uh, in which uh, we live? And of course, for this, the circuit is uh, extremely useful. Now, my questions will be in terms of the uh, historicity of, of this uh, circuit. This is per perfectly general. It applies uh, for capital as such. It, apply, it is an ahistorical uh, representation of the structures, the fundamental structures of capitalist reproduction. But what the, my question is, what about the phases of capitalism? Can we see phases of cap different phases or stages of capitalism in the circuit, or how can we distort the circuit or adapt the circuit of, or, or, or apply the circuit to understand different stages in the development of this particular beast? Now, in particular, in, in, I am especially interested in something uh, that uh, is co absolutely current. What, how can we see neoliberalism there? So how, we, how would we spot it there? And, in, and then, what is neoliberalism if we look at this uh, at this figure, how can we understand the defining, the distinguishing features uh, of uh, neoliberalism? Now, one thing that was suggested just a moment ago is that under financialized uh, forms of capitalism, capital spirals out of control. Now, I would appreciate if you could uh, explore the meaning uh, of this. Uh, you, you mentioned the issue of debt. You mentioned the issue of social discipline. What else can we say about this uh, particular craziness of capital? And then, my last question, and I'll stop here, um, what is the meaning of the current crisis? What is the meaning of the economic and political imbalances that we see in the world today in terms of our understanding of the circuit of capital there? So, for example, you mentioned the case of China, but let's talk about the case of the United States and the case of the UK. Does the uh, victory of Brexit, does the victory of Trump implied the end of neoliberalism, how can we read it using this particular set of tools uh, that we have here uh, in front of us? Thanks, thanks very much. Give David a few minutes to respond and then we'll open it up to the floor. Yeah, I, I mean, um, <clears throat> part of that uh, depends very much, uh, the, the answer to, to that question depends very much on uh, what I was mentioning, alluding to at the end, when I want to talk about the space and time of this. Uh, I mean, Marx, when he, when he just published the first volume of Capital, wrote a, a volume, wrote a letter to Kugelman, kind of saying, you know, the, uh, the real science begins when we start to study how the laws of value assert themselves uh, in every day life. Uh, and that, I think, is, uh, you know, one of the big uh, f forms of study that needs to be taken. Um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, for me anyway, uh, looking at this, uh, we tend to think that uh, neoliberalism is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, uh, I don't think there's any way you can say what China did between 2007 uh, and just recently is neoliberal. Uh, it was, in effect, a massive uh, Keynesian-style uh, program uh, because the Chinese lost something like 30 million jobs in the export sector in 2008 because of the collapse of the U.S. consumer market. Uh, they had 30 million uh, unemployed. If you have 30 million unemployed and you're in the Communist Party, you kind of say, well, you've got to do something, so what did they do? They said, build, 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 and they built, and they built, and they built. And when you're there, you just see what they built. I mean, it's just astonishing. It just really is uh, 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 astonishing. Um, 
And I, when I say I think that that's what kept global capitalism alive during those years, I, I think it's, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's, I don't know, it can make a pretty good case that that was so. Uh, a lot of Latin America experienced 2007, 2008, fairly shallow kind of effect. Uh, because of the China trade. It was sending raw materials to China, and the demand for raw materials in China was so huge that uh, Chile and places like this and countries like Australia uh, hardly felt 2007, 2008. So it was a big uh, Keynesian-type thing, and I think it's uh, interesting that um, one of the things that Donald Trump is uh, uh, suggesting is a vast infrastructural investment program and I think it's going to be very curious because the Republican Party will try to stop him, but the Democrats will support him. <laughs> so actually, in the middle of his presidency, he may switch parties. <laughs> um, but, but I think that, that he's, I mean, he's, he's promised jobs, jobs, and more jobs, and he, you've never seen economic development like it. How can he do it? Uh, you look at the options, he cannot do it by bringing jobs back from abroad, that's all impossible, you know, a little bit could be done, but that's impossible, and repatriating profits from, you know, US corporations, no, none of that's really going to work. The one thing he can do is to launch a huge, on the scale of China, type of uh, infrastructural redevelopment project, and my bet is that that is one of the things he's going to do, and try to do. And it's going to have the, and it's going to have to be deficit financed, and the Republican Party are either going to have to kind of, you know, I don't know, uh, it'll probably divide the Republican Party, but the, uh, like I say, the Democrats will 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 support him, and so, in a sense, uh, the kind of the ideological grasp of what a lot of neoliberal stuff has been weakening, it seems to me, over the last year anyway, and I think that this is. Uh, going to mean that we're going to move this way. And it has to be this way because China cannot continue on its path. It's already uh, got over-accumulation of capital in the built environment in a very, very big way. Surplus productive capacity in cement and steel, and we know what's going on with steel. They're dumping steel all over the place, and they're in trouble with the WTO and all that sort of that sort of thing. And so, so there's a lot of mess uh, in 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 the wake of uh, what, the, the, what the Chinese uh, did, uh, which is going to have to be cleaned up. But the Chinese cannot continue uh, at the pace that they did over the last you know ten years. Uh, they're, they're, they're pooped out, uh, frankly, uh, in terms of what they can do. And, and the only place that can really possibly do something to pick up the slack is, uh, is the United States. Uh, I don't think Britain's in a place to do anything very much, but, you know, but actually we could see an Anglo-American push of some kind. But at the same time, I think this whole kind of question of the, the debt bottling plants, as I call them, is, is, a, is, a very, is a very intriguing one. Because at the same time as, you know, we just came out a few years ago, a crash in the property market. Have you seen what's happening in the property market everywhere right now? I mean, this is another area where there's a huge amount of accumulation going on. It's through rental extractions and, and, and all the rest of it. So I think that, that, that uh, there have been many shifts which have been going on under neoliberalization, but the core of what neoliberalization was always about for me was a project on behalf of uh, the top 1% to try to accumulate even more wealth and power than they already had. And if you look at all of the data since 2007, 2008, who's accumulated all the wealth and power? Uh, the top 1%. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is one of those cases where, you know, as the capitalists sometimes say, like to say, you should never let a good crisis go to waste. And they've done a very good job of accumulating huge wealth and power. So in that sense, the neoliberal project, if, it, if you consider it as I tend to, as a class project uh, to monopolize as much wealth and power as you possibly can, that that is still alive and well, and I don't see any mass challenge uh, to that at this point. There could uh, arise a mass challenge very quickly uh, in, in, in certain ways, but again, maybe people want to talk about that and as a separate question. Thank you. Um, okay, so we will take uh, several questions. Um, 
And if you could just keep your contributions uh, succinct so we can get in as many people as possible. And there are two roving mics uh, around. Okay, I will take um, the woman over there in the yellow. Yeah. Do you want some? Yeah, okay, yeah. Hello. Um, Sorry, I got one. Well, my question uh, is about uh, something you said on the global level of uh, value production, circulation, and uh, distribution. And uh, do you think Marx already envisioned this uh, global aspect of uh, capital? Or is this something more recent we have to um, theorize about? Uh, because throughout Capital, from volume uh, one to three, when he is developing his more abstract theory, he is always giving examples uh, on world trade and uh, a more um, a global scope of uh, the, the theoretical approach he's pursuing. So is this something new or how, how do we theorize about it? Thanks. Um, sorry, I should just say, just indicate to me and I will kind of meet your eye. Um, and if you're taking too long, I will tap like this. <laughs> okay. Um, woman in the green um, and then Ale. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you. Okay. De degrowth. Yeah, yeah, de yeah degrowth. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I wanted to know your your perspective of this. Do you think it's something possible to do or not? Uh, and so, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm now. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll have you in there. Yep. Um, I have two questions. One about cement and one about money. Because you mentioned um, the Chinese cement exports. And it's true that China is the largest uh, cement exporter in the world, uh, just before Thailand. But uh, there has not been a big increase in the exports of cement since 2011. The country which has increased cement exports the most has been Greece, which has, of course, had a completely different mm -hmm. economic development than China. And perhaps you could explain that within your framework. My second question is about money. And you said that money could be expanded indefinitely or infinitely. But could the uh, National Bank of Sweden just add a few zeros to the debt? Would that work? And the same question in a different form is if the US growth falls rapidly, like it did in the Depression in the 1930s, could they continue adding zeros to the debt? Thank you. And you in the flat, yeah. Uh, you mentioned it briefly in relation to neoliberalism, uh, but the practical question is uh, the more conventional way of politics uh, resistance has been conceptualized in terms of factory, proletariat, in the production sphere. And since you're emphasizing the contemporary times is shifted towards distribution bondholders, how do you conceptualize a form of resistance with, within the distribution, sphere of distribution, and where do those struggles, uh, how do we articulate those struggles? Yeah. Thanks. We'll have Lenin.
which has valid uh, this university, which has also a representation the real value of this university. <laughs> We'd like to celebrate with you soon when we end our source. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lennon. Um, so we'll have you in the... Yeah. Hi. Hi, hello. Um, I'm Thanks. We'll have you. Yep. Thank you. It was more a general question about the model of the cycle. I'm very happy that you brought this because I said you want to relate to the human society. And I wonder what you think. Okay. Um, I wonder if you come across and what you think of the hydrosocial um, cycle mm -hmm. that kind of brings in more the human element mm -hmm. to show that actually water relations, you know, even in the water in the hydrosocial cycle, water is also extracted. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do you want to take a stab at those? And then all, right. Yeah. all right, I'll answer all those questions like that. <laughs> um, my God, where do we go? Um. <laughs> oh, let's start with the global thing. Yeah, um, Marx, uh, uh, it, uh, something interesting about the structure of the three volumes of Capital is that uh, the description of globalization uh, in the Communist Manifesto and in the Grundrisse is far, far more sophisticated and well-developed than it is in capital. And I've always found that rather surprising, but I can give you a, a, an explanation why. That uh, at the end of volume one of Capital, Marx dealt with the theory of colonization, which uh, actually was proposed by Hegel, which suggested that uh, uh, you could resolve the inner contradictions of capitalism via uh, colonization uh, procedures and uh, Marx's answer to that is that uh, uh, when you look at uh, actual colonization procedures and you look at the proposals of Wakefield and all of that uh, uh, what you see is that that uh, the colonizing power uh, wants to keep land under control in such a way that labor can't get access to the land so that labor will not have access to the means of production and will have to be a wage labor force. Uh, but secondly, he seems to suggest that uh, actually uh, Hegel's solution, which would solve the internal contradictions of, contradi of capital by some external uh, adjustment, uh, as far as Marx was concerned, it simply takes those, ex those internal contradictions and projects them onto uh, a higher, uh, a bigger stage, i.e. the world stage. So as far as Marx was concerned, he actually confines himself in the three volumes of Capital, for the most part looking at the internal contradictions of Capital. And he, he excludes uh, any systematic investigation of any ex external uh, what I call spatial fix to the to the uh, uh, over accumulation problems or, do, or problems of that kind. So uh, he tends to do that in capital. Now every now and again in capital he kind of says, well, you know, Australia comes into it like this, and India is turned into a field for for uh, part of the international deliver uh, uh, international division of labour. And of course, when he gets to finance and he gets uh, uh, to those questions, it's financing of foreign trade that starts to become significant. But by and large in capital, he tends to not to, to actually explore in any very deep and systematic way the processes of globalization. Those are, ex are much better explored in, in, as I've suggested, in the Grundrisse, 
uh, and in uh, uh, the Communist Manifesto, and there's some fantastic arguments made there. Uh, they're really very prescient about uh, what's going on, but uh, the globalization that's envisaged in the Communist Manifesto has taken eternity to, to be arrived at, but we're closer to it now than ever before. So, yeah, he's got that in his mind, that this is what capital is doing, and he says it's in the nature of capital to create the world market, and it's in the nature of capital to go global. I mean, he's, he's very clear about that. So his general argument is that, but in capital, it's not, as I said, well developed, because he's mainly concerned to say, I'm only concerned with the internal contradictions of capital, not some external, and I'm not, he's, not, he's not interested either in the general theory of what happens if you're dealing with monopoly capital, and he's not interested either in the general theory uh, with uh, what's the role of feudal residuals in a cap in actual capitalist society. He kind of says, I, present, I pretend those don't exist. So his theory in capital it doesn't get into those sorts of things. A uh, question of degrowth. Yeah, there's a, a kind of interesting literature going on on that, and of course we have some examples of degrowth which are rather uncomfortable to live with. I mean, you just, you just don't want to go and live in Detroit. Uh, and uh, there are shrinking cities around, which are, you know, but I think they are extremely interesting to look at for the, for the simple reason that if there is going to be uh, forced, as it were, degrowth by the, the collapse of, of economic uh, capacities like in the uh, Great Depression or something of that kind, then the question of how to handle that uh, is, is very much a, a political question on the agenda. I would argue, argue however, that, that, that what we're going to look at is not the, uh, not the, the abandonment of all growth, uh, but uh, selective uh, uh, development, selective growth, uh, which is, uh, could amount to degrowth in certain areas, or a kind of growth uh, which, which is far less stressful. Uh, for instance, 40% of the food supply in the United States goes to waste. Uh, now, uh, there's a lot of hungry people in the United States, uh, so there's, there's issues uh, about uh, are there ways to, 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 to utilize that, but that's going to take a form of sociality and, 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 and almost state subsidy and, and all the rest of state organization or you know, communal organization, something of that kind, to take the waste and turn it into something. Otherwise, you know, we can't all live as dumpster, dumpster divers, as they're called. You know, it's a bit little, 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 little difficult. But there are, there are all, all sorts of things, and, and there is a huge waste going on. Uh, one of the biggest areas of waste is I consider contemporary urbanization. We're building cities these days for people to invest in, not building cities for people to live in. And that's a huge waste, huge waste. We're building high-end condominiums in New York City like crazy, uh, all for the billionaires and the rich. At the same time, we've got a huge crisis of affordable housing. We have 60,000, 60,000 uh, you know, people who are on the streets uh, homeless people, 60,000 60, in the city, and 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 this is and the no no provision is being made. So all of these materials are being turned to build these things, which people are not going to live in. They're just going to invest in them. It's just for for, for people from uh, the Gulf states and so on to invest in. So there's plenty of ways in which you can start to say, okay, all of that effort has to be put to the creation of affordable housing for the mass of the population. And we don't have a decent uh, affordable housing program. So there are many things of that sort, which are switches of, uh, of, 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 of how assets are being. But that comes again and again from the fact that all of these forms of provision are provided through the market. And the market works extremely well uh, for those people who have money. If you don't have money, it doesn't work well at all. So housing is great if you know, you're know you the upper middle class. It's terrible if you're anywhere else, if you're any other social strata. So uh, it's not only degrading growth, it's reconfiguration of what growth is about, and we don't need to grow uh, the, agri you know, the food supply, we need to use the food supply we have in a much more efficient, much more effective, much more socially just uh, kind of way, so there are all sorts of uh, questions of, uh, of that kind. Um, the, 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 the grease cement, well, you know, you know the, everywhere 
you go, you all find, you will find, you know, specific examples of this kind, which don't uh, sort of immediately read off from a framework of this kind. And 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 I think that uh, obviously, if I'm looking at uh, something that's going on in the city of Baltimore, I can't go to the city of Baltimore and go to this and say, ah, this is the answer. No, I mean we have to work out from first principles exactly why, you know. Uh, I, I mean I happen to know why Greece, in lots of ways, is into cement because. Uh, cement uh, has been an important industry in Greece, and one of the things that's held it back all the time is all of this concern for ancient monuments. Well, right now, to the degree that they've been forced to actually sell off their, you know, and not bother about their uh, ancient monuments, they can uh, sort of start putting cement plants all over the place. And, and so this is, you know, again, this is an extractivism, but notice this is an extractivist economy. And, and cement extraction is is... If you've lived next to a cement plant, it's not nice. And actually, it's, it's high polluting and it's high energy consuming and it's, you know, it's bad for greenhouse gases, everything else. So the fact that the, Gre the Greeks are into something which is a noxious form of industry doesn't supply, surprise me at all because they'd be giving no option except to go into those kinds of, those kinds of industries. Now, could Sweden... Uh, you know, we, you know, the world central banks have become, of course, crucial institutions. Um, Sweden, uh, on its own, probably not such a good position. The big ones who can actually add zeros to their their, you know, are, are the European Central Bank, and and uh, uh, of course the Federal Reserve and the Bank of China. Um, they can add the zeros. And what have they done? They've actually engaged in something called quantitative easing, which is actually adding zeros to the money supply. And where's all the money gone? It hasn't gone actually into a productive activity. It's mainly gone to the financial sector. And what have they done? They basically bought out their own, you know, they've deleveraged and, and, and uh, you know, bought back their own stock and it's forced up the stock market. It hasn't done anything. Uh, very much to, to, to actually stimulate uh, that much growth. You need fiscal policies, not monetary policies. Uh, but, uh, but unfortunately, you know, in most of the Western world, fiscal policies have been ruled out. I think they're going to come back. I think that's one of the things that Trump is going is 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 to bring back. Um, this also goes down to, to the question of class interest. Um, and... and um, uh, I haven't mapped that in here, and this applies also to the hydrological thing. Um, you know, to me, the value theory of Marx is very much about alienation, and therefore the whole kind of question of alienation from nature, which is why I'm talking a little bit at the bottom here about free gifts of nature and how those free gifts of nature are appropriated and turned into rental streams by capital and what that does in terms of... Of, of, of the nature of the labor process and the nature of the struggles, which are increasingly about uh, alienated, uh, an alienating world. I mean, uh, the, you know, the, the, the politicians keep, keep talking about you know, creating jobs. The problem right now is there are no meaningful jobs. So it's not only jobs, it's meaningful jobs. And I think that the state of alienation in society is, is, is huge all over the place. Some of that alienation is, is, is emerging uh, over the realization question. And that brings me to the, the, the accumulation by dispossession. There's a politics of production. Marx talks a lot about that. And there's a long history in Marxism talking about the politics of production. There's also a politics of realization uh, uh, and, and, and a politics of distribution. And if you are in a city like New York right now, and you say, what's more important, the politics of production or the politics of realization? And people kind of say, well, what do you mean by politics of realization? I mean, the way the credit card companies put extra money on, the way the telephone companies screw you, the way in which uh, the landlords are jacking up rents at a rate which is absolutely, absolutely unlivable. Uh, you know, why, you know, so there's actually class struggle, fierce class struggle goes on at the point of realization, except it's not class struggle in the sense it is at the production. In production, there's a relationship between capital and labor. But as Marx points out, at the point of realization, the laborer is a consumer. So the, the big fight that goes on in realization is between buyers and sellers. And that's a different structure of, of political protest. 
But if I'm trying to get somebody to understand what's going on in this system, and I say, okay, let's go around and look at the look at the fighting points. What what you know? What in this audience did you have yesterday, which really got you mad as hell? Was it something that in production, or was it something that's going on at the point of realization? And you find realization is very strong, and there's a huge amount of accumulation by dispossession going on, and a lot of it is, of course, at the point of realization. The foreclosure movement was accumulation by dispossession, okay? And the evictions that are going on all over the place is, is just, just astonishing, everywhere, everywhere. Not only, you know, I mean, I've just come back from Barcelona. Barcelona, the eviction's going on, uh, you know, people, a lot of organizing, anti-eviction organizing. Here we have evictions in the United States, uh, you know, also. So what's going on at the point of realization is a political, is a, is a political quagmire in terms of, of, of all sorts of uh, movements which are, which are sort of emanating there, and if you look, at what the main movements have been over the last 15 years. It's things like Gezi Park, which was not a production movement. It, the, the, what happened in Brazil in, in, in 2013 was not about production. It was about daily life in the cities and the impossibility of having a decent life in a decent living environment in a decent city. And therefore, there is a, a level of protest which is going on in terms of urban-based protests of alienated populations living in a sea of alienation and a lot of political kind of movement of people trying to create unalienated heterotopic spaces in cities where they can do something different and not be caught within this, this kind of sea of alienating behavior and, and, and demands which are constructed in, in urban environments. So a lot, a lot of political protest is actually around urban issues and that is classically about questions of distribution, particularly in the way in which the rentier class is extracting rents hand over fist in, in, the, in, the, in the cities right now and forcing uh, you know, prices, land prices and, and, and property prices up and up and up, affecting not just simply you know, working people, that you know, affecting everybody. For instance, one of the biggest protest groups in, you know, in, in New York right now, potentially, are the small individual family businesses uh, in the restaurant trade, who are all being forced out of business by the fact that rents are being doubled and tripled uh, at, at a drop of a hat, and they cannot afford it anymore. So this is the world in which, you know, the, 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 str the political struggles around this map are interesting. Classically, Marxists have always concentrated on the struggles at, at the point of production and production value. Actually, I'm kind of always been interested as an urbanist in, in, in the struggles over realization and also over distribution. And right now, I think distribution struggles are as significant as the production struggles. And this is why you get into the question of what's the alternative uh, to all of the ways in which debt bottling plants are, are working. Can you do it uh, with local currencies? And I'm sorry to tell you, my answer is no. You can't do it with local currencies. I like local currencies. Who wouldn't? You know, they're friendly if you if they go go right. They're usually small. Uh, they're usually okay for redistributing. But all the time, the local currencies are convertible into the major currency. They're they're just a sort of a spin-off of the major structure. And it allows a certain kind of sociality to function, which is very good and very nice, but it doesn't do anything very much uh, to actually create an alternative uh, monetary form. If you want an alternative monetary form, there are two conditions that have to prevail. The first is that it should not be convertible. You cannot convert it into the main currency. It has to remain independent, strictly independent of the major currency. And the second thing is uh, that that currency has to be oxidizable. That is, you cannot accumulate wealth and power through it. And by oxidizable, I mean if you don't use it, it disappears. Uh, in other words, uh, for those of you familiar with this, the, the model we would have in our society right now would be airline miles. If you don't use them in two years, they disappear. You know, well, if you had a form of money that was like that, if in two years you didn't use it, you know, it disappeared, then, then, then you wouldn't be able to accumulate. So the, 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 the anti-accumulation form of money is absolutely crucial. But you can't do the anti-accumulation form of money all the time. You've got a form of money which is actually uh, convertible into the main currency. So the, it depends a little bit on how the local currencies are constructed. 
But most of them are constructed uh, around this kind of form of sociality, which I think is, 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 is nice in a way. And I think if you can establish good, decent social relations with people, it comes back to this idea of creating heterotopic little spaces within uh, a sea of, uh, of alienation. And I think that that's okay. Uh, I'm all in favor of uh, doing that. But what we need to do is to think about the, the, the sorts of strategies that are needed to create a macro transformation uh, towards an alternative kind of society. Um, sh we'll, so we'll take one last round of questions. So I've got you and then you. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, I was, you brief me, briefly mentioned this uh, just now, but I was curious in, in the role played uh, by these two aspects that seem to function as a substratum for, for this whole cycle, which is the production and reproduction of nature and the production and reproduction of human nature. How do you conceptualize that as, uh, you know, the role that it plays in, in, in generating crisis? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah. Just over here. I think that's it's quite related, actually. Um, it was really interesting, uh, particularly this idea of infinities and value and anti-value. And I, I just wondered, there seems to be a clear relationship between wants, needs, and desires, and the uh, categorization or definition of whether or not value is value or anti-value. And I wondered if you thought wants, needs, and desires were, were finite or not, uh, and what are the implications of your answer for the future of this model? in terms of the creation of value and anti-value, either in theory or, or in current time and space. So. Thanks, we'll have uh, at the back there, at the very back. I'm concerned that your model leaves out the way that capitalism developed in the 20th century, and in particular the role of the nation state as a factor in intercapitalist and interimperialist competition between nation states. And I'm concerned that that would lead you to, to minimize the importance of how a, a, an important section of the ruling classes in the Western countries are mobilizing these nationalist, right-wing, populist, misogynist movements in, in Germany, France, the US with Trump and so on. So if you take your infrastructure spend, uh, uh, policy for Trump, I guess I'm thinking of somebody else that had an infrastructure spending policy in the 1930s in Germany. whether in that uh, figure the gift of free gift of nature and free gift of human nature um, are, can actually uh, be categorized as anti-value because that whole system relies on those things not being valued, then nature and human nature would be the greatest source, uh, among the great source of anti-value. Yeah. Okay, the woman at the back there. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could share your opinion on what stands development countries should take towards financial liberalization. Thanks. And uh, the man in the front, in the black, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I was wondering whether you could uh, reflect a bit. I was thinking, I mean, I was reading this morning uh, Polanyi. Uh, <laughs> And I do see some sort of connection with this idea of the fictitious commodities, land, labor, and money, and the connection with the, with sort of the three stages here as well, production, uh, sort of uh, the realization of value, which could be uh, labor and demand, and then the idea of money, and whether you agree with his impression that in different times you'll have different balances. I think you kind of mentioned it, how now, we have a primacy of interest and the distribution problems, but whether you could expand on that, whether you can have different balances in time. Thanks. And one last question over here. Yeah. Okay, just over there in the white shirt. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, my question was uh, more to do with the international movement of labor, and uh, you, you talked about sort of the decline in the levels of um, growth across the world and how that has resulted in the movement of capital, commodities, etc. I was wondering if you can say something also about the movement of labor, and in particular I'm referring to the sort of the so-called migration crisis, where we are seeing the contradictory policies of sort of importing of cheap migrant workers at the same time a very selective sort of migration barrier being set up. Thank you. Thanks, and actually one final, final question <laughs> over here. Um, predictions was like overproduction and which might get diverted into arms production. I think there was a, an example of that recently when the Labour Party was discussing Trident and we had some trade unionists saying, well, we must make Trident submarines at this enormous expense because otherwise it wouldn't have any jobs. That seems to be a particularly intellectually disreputable argument. Anyway. Thanks. So we'll give David a few minutes <laughs> for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, the whole question of uh, uh, the relation to nature and human nature and, and the like. Um, <clears throat> Marx at various times uh, did talk about uh, the free gifts of nature and the significance of those free gifts uh, for any uh, economic activity. Um, he also talked about uh, the uh, uh, productive capacities of populations, uh, particularly their, their skills, their culture, their understanding of various things. Uh, and at times he ventured into the notion of a species being which is not a theory of uh, the essentialist theory of, of human nature, but was uh, a discovery theory of what potentialities exist within our human nature to construct an uh, alternative, uh, uh, construct ourselves in, in alternative ways. I've long held about, and when I'm writing about cities, that uh, one of the big questions uh, is not uh, so much what kind of city we want, uh, but what kind of people we want to be. Uh, because the way we construct cities actually dictates a lot of things to us in terms of what kinds of people we have to be in order to live in that kind of environment. Uh, what kinds of values we should have and so on. So there's a complicated relationship between human nature and uh, the uh, use uh, of uh, uh, and our relation to nature and it's, it's not, of course, a done deal that we simply respond to the requirements of a capitalist social order uh, blindly and without uh, expressing any kind of alternative. So that there are, of course, deep ecology movements and ecological movements that are actually an antagonistic to capital precisely because capital demands of us that we utilize uh, nature, we, we turn it into uh, what Heidegger called sort of one big gasoline station. Uh, and and uh, in objecting uh, to that, uh, people actively become anti-value. They become anti uh, the, 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 the mode of value that capital is developing. And I think it's important always to understand, uh, in my understanding of the theory of value, that, it's, that Marx is describing capital's theory of value. It's not his theory of value, it's capital's theory of value. And people kind of read Marx's theory of value and get mad as hell at him and say, you know, God, the guy, is, he doesn't take account of women, he doesn't take account of this, he doesn't take account of that. And my response to that is, well, yeah, but he's just representing what capital's about. Capital doesn't take any notice of that kind of stuff. Capital doesn't care what it produces. Capital doesn't care what use values it sets up or destroys. Uh, you know, so actually what Marx is reflecting is a theory of value which is in inherent in the way in which uh, capital works, which leads into a, an interesting kind of political question because yeah, because value has such a, a positive connotation, I think a lot of people want to be included in it. But Marx is very clear 
that uh, to be a value producer under capitalism is a misfortune. And why on earth would you want to put household labor as a commodity and have wages for it? I mean, why would you want it to be inside the wages system? And the wages system is the problem. We should be doing things the other way around. We should be taking the good sides of social relations, which exist in, uh, say, household activities and the rest of it, insofar as they're not discolored by patriarchy and all those other things that we, we, can, we can be critical of. But why are we not kind of taking the, those good aspects of social relations which exist in those environments which are non-commodified and seek to spread them at a greater greater level to the commons around us and, and you know why is why is why why don't we take the sort of household as a site where anti-value can be cultivated and actually acted upon and so this is to me is a, and again why wouldn't we take the kind of question of our relation to nature and instead of saying nature contributes to value and these marxists don't take any notice of that and you say well yeah well that's cuz capital doesn't give a shit about nature you know i mean we 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 are actually uh, you know uh, if we want to reconstruct uh, and, and end up with an un unalienated relation to nature we have to actually get beyond capital and out of capital relations uh, so those are the sorts of uh, political questions that, that come up around, uh, uh, around this. And, and this, uh, this question, so this question of, of nature, human nature, and, 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 and the like um, is, a, is, a, is, is a very broad one, obviously, but it does have a, a lot of uh, uh, politics uh, to it. On the question of the state and all the rest of it, uh, this, you know, with any... With any framework that you set up of this kind, uh, there is always uh, the danger of uh, imagining that it's trying to deal with something that it's, that it's not oriented to do. My interest in this is, is then to go on and ask the question, uh, what is the space and time of this? Uh, and when you come into the question of what is the space and time of this, you start to get some very, very interesting questions. For example, why is it that we assume there is only one value theory that is appropriate? Why are we not actually saying there are different value regimes? And actually, there's a very good reason why Marx said there's only one. It's because he assumed a perfectly competitive capitalist society. What happens if you have monopoly power in any form? And by the way, all Spatial competition is monopolistic competition. Therefore, the conditions under which Marx derived his initial theory of value do not hold. Therefore, we have to have an alternative notion of value. And one of the things that this does is to start to suggest that, uh, in fact, the whole history of capitalism has been about competition between alternative and different value regimes. And those alternative value regimes uh, often utilize notions of culture and they use no notions of nation and all the rest of it and the state and territoriality and belonging and, and even at the local level. So that if you say, what is the value regime of, say, indigenous populations in Amazonia, you'll end up with a different answer than uh, what the value regimes are of, uh, say, uh, contemporary Sweden. And actually, a lot of geopolitics is about the attempt to construct distinctive value regimes. I mean, what's the United States trying to do when it sets up this kind of trans-Pacific partnership? It's trying to define a territory which is a value regime in which it itself would be hegemonic in a situation where the U.S amount of global trade has been declining steadily over the last few years, is trying to set up a territorial structure in which a value regime in which it will be hegemonic, which is antagonistic to both China and the European Union. And what do you think Germany is doing within the European Union? It's actually kind of struck a value regime within the uni uh, Union uh, of a certain sort. And everybody has to obey, as it were, the autocratic demands of Schauble and all the rest of it. I mean, so the Greeks are put in the position they are because they are inserted in a particular value regime and that is what it's doing. So why can't we start thinking about the alternate, alternative value regimes and structures and recognize that actually part of this is then set up with this whole kind of question of migration of labor, which is a very, very, very significant point of this. But as soon as you get into the question of what's the space and time of all of this, 
suddenly this thing is no longer a map of this kind. It's, a, it's something very radically different. It is a, a, what Marx describes, or begins to describe in the Communist Manifesto when he starts talking about globalization or in those fantastic passages uh, in the Grundrisse where he's talking about the construction of the world market through, through capital accumulation and capital dynamics. And you also have to take into account the fact that capital produces spaces. Differential rent, too, is about you know, the, 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 the rent that accrues because of investments in the land. Well, differential investments in the land have actually produced a rent service in the world, which is radically different. The, 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 the investments in the land in the United States are of a different kind than investments in the land in, say, Central Africa. Therefore, there's a differential rent, too, to be had out of just the very fact the United States has created the value regime in the way it has. And the value regime is often set up with state power trying to reconfigure it in a certain kind of way. So this notion of differential value regimes comes out of the space and time of value, and the, de and the demographics of it are also extremely interesting. So I can make the, I can make the, the story respond to some of the questions that you're talking about but, but and on the basis of and do it on the basis of this but simply by saying what's the space and time of movement that's involved here you cannot have motion without talking about this, the context of space and time in which that motion is occurring otherwise it's an abstracted notion of, mo, mo, of, of motion that's why i pay great attention to marx's letter to kugelman when he says the real science begins when you've got the abstract law which you wanted, which is this, and then you start to see how it asserts itself in practice. And when you start to look at how it asserts itself in practice, you come up against all of the things that you're talking about. But when you, when you do start to do it in practice, what you find is that actually you get a deeper understanding of this. You just don't say, oh, this is irrelevant. You find a deeper understanding of this. So that, for example, in the creation of, of, of the relationship between the bondholders and the different value regimes. Marx has, a, for instance, just take this on money. When Marx talks about money, he kind of says, you know, there are lots of local monies and there are lots of, uh, you know, kind of uh, currencies around. And currencies are disaggregated. They're, they all have their national emblems and their national clothing. And then they strip them off and they go on the world stage and they're world money. And there's a difference between world money, he says, and all of those local kinds of rep representations of world money, which are the different currencies which exist. So currency regimes are disaggregated. If currency regimes are disaggregated, why can't value regimes be disaggregated? Because money is a representation of value. And if the representation is dis disaggregated, why should we presume that the value which is, is representing also cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, disaggregated? So I'm, I'm interested in that, and I think that it does get us down to being able to start to think of different value regimes and how they work and what the consistent con conditions are under which a particular value regime will be become hegemonic. Because this is, in effect, what's been happening in terms of his historical, historically. I mean, if we were having this conference, uh, this, this talk, uh, back in the 1980s, we would be looking at uh, West Germany and Japan as the dominant uh, hegemonic uh, uh, leaders of what global capitalism was about. If you got to the 1990s and the Washington Consensus, then it was the United States. Recently, it's been China. You know, and so, and, and China, and, and there's some interesting telltale signs, by the way. I mentioned the, the way in which the U.S. is trying to set up these Trans-Pacific and CAFTA and all those kinds of things, which are regional hegemonic value regimes. The U.S. is trying, you know, is 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 trying 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 to do that. But I'm 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 kind of sort of pursuing these sorts of things in this in this in this sort of way. And yeah, it's it becomes more of a. Uh, a, a bit of a fight to, 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 to start to talk about actually how capital uses space and time and how it produces space and time and what that production is all about and how it, how it actually works. But I think there are some things could be said on, on, the, on, on, on the basis of this. And this question of the relationship, for example, right now, one of the crucial questions, what's the power of the bondholders versus the power of nation states? That's one of the big questions. 
And always, you know, Bill Clinton's famous, you know, when he came into power and said he wanted to do this and this, and that was his economic program. And Rubin, you know, from Wall Street, told him he couldn't do it. And he said, well, why not? He says, well, because Wall Street won't let you. And the famous line from Clinton was, you mean to say, my whole economic program is held hostage to a bunch of fucking bond traders? And Rubin said, yes. <laughs> and so what did Clinton do? He came in promising uh, health care, universal health care, and he gave us NAFTA and the end of Glass-Steagall, and he gave us the reform of welfare, as you know it. He gave us all of the neoliberal stuff. I mean, this is the power of, of the bondholders actually being exerted over the, over the nation states. And I think that that is where the national thing comes in and, and the, 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 the kind of the global thing comes in. So, you know, I have some ideas about this, but they're very loose ideas and, and, and ones that I can't actually sort of kind of certify with lots of data and all this kind of stuff. But that's the sort of way of thinking that I think has to be applied to this kind of thing. So you just don't say, this is all there is. This is the beginning point. Mark's kind of very clear about that. This is a sort of beginning point. And once you've got the beginning point, you can then start to ask some deeper and more profound questions. And you go on and on and on, and that is a never-ending process. That's a sort of a, a bad infinity in the other direction because you can never get to the end of it. Yeah.